welcome to Medical Dialogues, your daily dose of health and medical news. I'm Mr. Zaman and here is what I bring to you all from the world of medicine. The dependence of working memory on reciprocal interactions across the brain. In a new study published in Nature, neuroscientists at the Sainsbury Welcome Center at UCL investigated the reciprocal interactions between two brain regions that represent visual working memory in mice. The team found that communication between these two loci of working memory, parietal cortex and premortal cortex, was codependent and instantaneous timescales. SWC researchers compared a working memory dependent task with a simpler working memory independent task. In the working memory task, mice were given a sensory stimulus followed by a delay and then had to match the next stimulus to the one they saw prior to the delay. This meant that during the delay, the mice needed a representation in their working memory of the first stimulus to succeed in the task and receive a reward. In contrast, in the working memory independent task, the decision the mice made on the second secondary stimulus was unrelated to the first stimulus. By contrasting these two tasks, they found that most neural activities was unrelated to working memory and instead working memory representations were embedded within high dimensional modes of activity, meaning that only small fluctuations around the mean firing of individual cells were together carrying the working memory information. To understand how these representations are maintained in the brain, the neuroscientists used a technique called optogenetics to selectively silence parts of the brain during the delay period and observe the disruption to what the mice were remembering. Interestingly, they found that silencing working memory representations in either one of the parietal or premortal cortical areas led to similar deficits in the mice's ability to remember the previous stimulus, implying that these representations were instantaneously codependent on each other during the day. To test this hypothesis, the researchers disrupted one area while recording the activity that was being communicated back to it by the other area. When they disrupted parietal cortex, the activity that was being communicated by premortal cortex to parietal areas, parietal cortical areas was largely unchanged in terms of average activity. However, the representation of working memory activity specifically was disrupted. This was also true in the reverse experiment when they disrupted premortal cortex and looked at parietal cortex and also observed working memory specific disruption of cortical cortical communication. Innovative online automated obesity treatment program which shows weight loss results. Preliminary evidence shows the potential for a fully automated online behavioral obesity treatment program to serve as a pragmatic resource in the primary care setting according to a new study in obesity, the Obesity Society's flagship journal. The current study is one of the first times that a fully automated obesity treatment program has been tested pragmatically in a large primary care network with clinicians responsible for identifying patients, providing the program and supporting its use. As part of routine primary care, healthcare providers and 16 nurse care managers offered a no-cost online obesity treatment program named RX Weight Loss or RXWL to 1765 patients at the Rhode Island Primary Care Physicians Corp, a primary care practice organization which includes approximately 60 practices with 100 physicians. Eligible patients were aged 18 to 75 years old with a body mass index of greater than or equal to 25 kg per square meter and internet access. The majority of the 464 patients who ultimately enrolled in the program and engaged with treatment were white and females. 2% of the sample identified as Hispanic or Latin ethnicity and Black or African American. The program included 12 weekly online sessions, a self-monitoring program and automated feedback. The average 12-week weight loss was 5.10%. Researchers note that most e-health obesity treatment reports average weight losses of 2.5% initial body weight at 12 or 24 weeks. Patients who reported their weight on all 12 weeks achieved an estimated weight loss of 7.2% compared to 3.4% in those submitting less frequently. Patients who accessed all 12 video lessons achieved an estimated weight loss of 8% compared to 4.2% for patients who accessed fewer lessons. Neither BMI, sex, nor identification with a racial or ethnic minority group were associated with these measures of engagement, but age was associated with a greater number of lessons viewed. 
The study's authors observed that further research will help determine whether the disproportionately small number of men and racial or ethnic minorities enrolled in this program results from the characteristics of the patients seen in these practices, a bias on the part of the clinicians in referring patients to the program, or lack of interest in weight loss expressed by these patients. Efforts to increase initial engagement with the program will help determine the effectiveness of the program in patients who may be less motivated to lose weight. About the pain which is caused by exercise which improves walking ability in people with peripheral artery disease. This study examined the effects of home-based walking for exercise among 264 people with PAD who were participating in a randomized clinical trial called the Low Intensity Exercise Intervention in PAD or LIGHT which included 305 people overall. From September 2015 to December 2019, participants enrolled in the LIGHT study at four US medical centers. Their their average age was 69 years, 48% were women and 61% were black adults. Researchers randomly assigned participants to one of three groups for 12 months. The first group or 38% walked at home at a comfortable pace. The second group or 41% walked at home at a pace that induced leg symptoms, while the third group or 21% did not walk for exercise. Both walking exercise groups wore an actigraph, a device that monitored the intensity of their walking and the time they walked. At the study's start and at 6 and 12 months, participants completed three tests of leg function, walking speed over a 4 meter distance or 13 feet at usual pace, walking speed over a 4 meter distance at fastest pace and the short physical performance battery or SPPB, consisting of 4 meter walking velocity at usual pace, a standing balance test and the time for 5 repeated chair rises. The key findings were as follows. At six months, participants whose walking pace induced leg pain or discomfort walked 11 feet per minute faster, and at 12 months, they walked more than 16 feet per minute faster than participants whose walking pace did not induce leg pain or discomfort. Compared to non-exercisers, participants in the group that walked for exercise at a pace inducing leg pain or discomfort walked nearly 13 feet per minute faster at six months. However, this increase was not statistically significant at 12 months. At 12 months, people who walked for exercise with leg pain or discomfort scored almost one point higher on the sum of the three leg function tests, that is the short physical performance battery, out of a total of 13 points, 0 to 12, compared to people who walked at a comfortable pace with no leg pain. For those walking for exercise at a comfortable pace, there was no improvement in walking speed at 6 months or 12 months compared to non-exercisers. It is important to note that study participants walked at home, so the results may not apply to walking on the treadmill in the presence of a health professional, which is a standard of care and first-line therapy according to clinical practice guidelines different response of different people to psychedelic drugs. Recently, there has been a renewed interest and research in using psychedelic compounds that stimulate serotonin receptors in the brain because of several promising results from clinical trials. These receptors bind serotonin 5-hydroxytryptamine 5-HT and other similar amine-containing molecules helping regulate people's mood, perceptions, cognition and emotions as well as their appetite. In particular, the serotonin receptor known as 5-HT2A is responsible for mediating the effects of psychedelic drugs. However, there are several naturally occurring random genetic variations known as single nucleotide polymorphisms that can impact the 5-HT2A receptor structure and function. So Brian Roth and colleagues wanted to explore how variations in the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor impacted the in vitro activity of four psychedelic therapies. The researchers used a series of assays to measure the effect that seven different SNPs had on in vitro binding and signaling of the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor when in the presence of psilocin LSD, 5-MeO-DMT, or mescaline. Their results indicated that some gene variations, even once at a distance from the binding site, alter the way the receptor interacts with the psychedelic drugs. 
For example, the single nucleotide polymorphism ALA230TH had both increased and reduced responses to the drugs tested compared to the original version of the gene, whereas the HIS452TH mutation showed only reduced effects. Based on their results, the researchers expect that patients with different genetic variations would react differently to psychedelic assisted treatments. They suggest that physicians consider the genetics of a patient's serotonin receptors to identify which psychedelic drug compound is likely to be the most effective treatment. That's all for today. Stay tuned to Medical Dialogues for latest updates. Never miss a medical update from Medical Dialogues. Like, subscribe, and press the bell icon.